Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, Exzellenzen, sehr geehrter Herr Premierminister Netanyahu, sehr geehrte Frau Netanyahu, ich begrüße Sie zusammen mit den anwesenden Staats- und Regierungschefs und hochrangigen Repräsentanten aus aller Welt auf das Allerherzlichste hier bei uns in der Residenz, meine Damen und Herren, in unserem Kaisersaal. Ein herzliches Willkommen in Bayern. Vor vier, Vor 400 Jahren, als diese Räumlichkeiten gebaut wurden, haben die Menschen in Europa erst nach zwei Wochen erfahren, dass es den Prager Fenstersturz gegeben hat. Heute wissen wir nach Minuten, manchmal sogar nach Sekunden, über ein Ereignis Bescheid, auch wenn es am anderen Ende der Welt stattgefunden hat. Aber umso größer und je größer die Komplexität und die Ungewissheiten sind, die Menschen tun sich immer mehr schwer, auch die Dinge dann einzuordnen. Und fest steht, die Konflikte werden mehr auf der ganzen Welt und die Krisen werden auch mehr. Und deshalb ist der Bedarf für einen Dialog, und zwar einen direkten Dialog und vor allem auch das gegenseitige Zuhören, so groß wie bisher noch nie. Lieber Herr Botschafter Ischinger, die Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz steht für Informationen aus der allerersten Hand und auch den Austausch auf höchster Ebene. Die Welt schaut in diesen Tagen gebannt nach München. Sie machen mit Ihrem großartigen Einsatz die Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz zu einer wirklich einzigartigen Plattform. Und die Entscheider aus der ganzen Welt wissen, in München werden wichtigste Impulse für die Sicherheit der Welt gesetzt. Heute verleihen Sie den Ewald von Gleispreis an ein Urgestein der Konferenz. Senator John McCain ist ein leidenschaftlicher Kämpfer für unsere westlichen Werte, ein Mann, der unerschütterlich zu seinen Überzeugungen steht. Leider kann er heute nicht bei uns sein. Umso mehr begrüße ich seine Gattin, sehr geehrte Frau McCain. Herzlich willkommen bei uns. Und ich bitte Sie auch im Namen der gesamten Bayerischen Staatsregierung und natürlich auch von unserem Ministerpräsidenten, der leider heute erkrankt ist, herzliche Gratulation zu dieser außerordentlichen Auszeichnung. Sehr geehrter Herr Premierminister Netanyahu, mit Ihrer Teilnahme als Ehrengast bereichern Sie ganz besonders die Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz auf das Allerhöchste. Ich freue mich auch Sie im Namen der Bayerischen Staatsregierung und unseres Ministerpräsidenten aufs Neue, dass wir die tiefe Freundschaft mit Israel heute erneut bekunden können. Im Dezember 2017 haben wir ein bayerisches Büro in Israel eröffnet. Und auch die Eröffnung des Erinnerungsortes für das menschenverachtende Attentat bei den Olympischen Spielen im Jahr 1972 hatten wir im vergangenen Jahr. Staatspräsident Rifflin und unser Ministerpräsident haben hier ein ganz klares Zeichen gesetzt. Wir machen uns stark für Freundschaft zwischen unseren Völkern und wir sind auch sehr entschlossen, Antisemitismus, Fanatismus und auch Terrorismus zu bekämpfen. Ich versichere Ihnen, die Menschen in Bayern und Deutschland sind an Ihrer Seite, an der Seite Israels. Meine sehr geehrten Damen und Herren, Sie wissen, wir sind im Moment in der Bildung der Regierung in Deutschland. Wir sind auch zuversichtlich. Aber eines ist auf alle Fälle sicher, bei allen Streitfragen und bei vielen Kompromissen, die wir gemacht haben, können Sie auf eines zählen, wir stehen zu unserer Verantwortung. Deutschland ist ein verlässlicher Partner für Europa und für die ganze Welt. Und gerade in diesen 
unsicheren Zeiten sind Vertrauen und eben auch Zusammenarbeit wichtiger denn je. Nutzen wir die Chancen, die wir bei der Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz haben. Gehen wir Konflikte an und suchen nach friedlichen Lösungen. Stellen wir uns der Verantwortung für eine sichere und eine friedvolle Welt. Das wünsche ich Ihnen allen und bedanke mich für Ihr Kommen. Seien Sie herzlich willkommen. Thank you very much uh, for those kind words, Deputy Prime Minister Eichner. Thank you for the hospitality of the uh, government of Bavaria and this conference under the leadership of uh, Dr. Ischinger. It's wonderful to be here with so many uh, heads of state and uh, senior government officials, senior business officials, uh, and uh, able representatives of uh, free governments. Uh, I include among them Vice President Joe Biden, my good friend of many, many years, Herbert McMaster, the National Security Advisor of the United States of America, and so many others who are here, with whom um, quite a few of you have worked over the years at our common quest for peace and security. It's a delight to be here. I want to thank you for this tremendously warm hospitality. I must say, I've had dinner in many places, never in a room like this. The decor is impressive, the friendship even more. And I appreciate the, uh, the friendship you've shown me, my wife Sarah, and our entire delegation. We uh, face extraordinary opportunities and extraordinary challenges. Just as I was sitting here, uh, several uh, leaders of German industry came to me and said, you know, we're doing things in Israel. We're finding their technology like we've never seen anywhere else. Well, it's true. There is a change in the world. The change is uh, a result of uh, something that you can see just by looking, just by looking at the 10 leading companies 10 years ago and the 10 largest companies now. 10 years ago, They included five energy companies and one IT, Exxon. There was one, sorry, one IT, which was Microsoft. Ten years later, in a brief blink of an eye in historical time and economic times, it's reversed. Five IT companies, one left. Exxon went from number one to number five. Wealth is being produced by the products of the mind. It's mightier than oil. It's mightier than gas. It's mightier than natural resources. It is the most potent source of wealth. Israel tried to have a car company. I talked to the uh, chairman of Daimler-Benz here. Okay, Daimler. Well, we tried. We failed miserably. 50 years ago, as a young officer in the Israeli army, I was given a car, an Israeli-made car. It was made of um, fiberglass. One day, I leaned on the car. My elbow went right through. More or less, that coincided with the end of our attempt to compete. We couldn't compete, not with chassis, not with the tires, not with engines. But we compete now. Because very soon, 85% of the value of a car will be software. It's basically a computer on wheels. Now we have 500 startup companies that are selling for billions of dollars, some of them, billions of dollars because of this change, this transformation. And it's basically the promise of the confluence of artificial intelligence, big data, and connectivity. And new industries are being spawned so fast. Digital health, cybersecurity, autonomous vehicles, we're there. And therefore, <clears throat> I'd like to invite all of you Uh, next year to our, this year, to our innovation conference in Israel, we won't have the same settings, but the same warmth and the same quest for a better world for all of us. This is the opportunity. The challenge is that there are mighty forces 
that seek to drag us back to a dark era. This is what we face in my region, in my neighborhood, and throughout the world. Forces of tyranny, forces of terror, forces of radicalism, forces of intolerance. And we have to counter them. This is why this conference is so important. The Munich Security Conference can, must, and does address these momentous issues. And I'm going to speak about that tomorrow. But tonight, we also honor a man of impeccable integrity and valor, one I'm proud to call my friend, the incomparable John McCain. John McCain refused to bow his head before torture and terror. And he has stood up for our common values of freedom and dignity with tremendous integrity that never flinched under any circumstances over the years. I want you to know, Cindy, Mrs. McCain, that we have drawn, and I have drawn, tremendous inspiration from the courage of John McCain. Courage, the Romans said, is not the only virtue, but it's the one that guarantees all the others. Security is not the only aspect of policy, but it is the one that ensures that all other good policies are possible. For without security, we will deteriorate very rapidly into a world of chaos, tyranny, and violence. Security comes first. This is the main message that I have today. We must stop radical regimes from threatening our security. We must prevent them from getting nuclear weapons, and we must defeat the terrorists. We'll talk about that tomorrow. But tonight, I want to join all of you in a salute to our hero of our times who understood and understands security, Senator John McCain. Thank you. Thank you all. Frau Staatsministerin, Frau Staatsministerin Eigner, Exzellenzen, meine Damen und Herren, ich möchte mich zunächst einmal ganz herzlich bei Ihnen, liebe Frau Staatsministerin, liebe Frau Eigner, für diesen großartigen Abend bedanken, bei Ihnen und natürlich bei der gesamten Staatsregierung. Und ich möchte Und ich möchte sagen, dass es natürlich einen guten Grund gibt, warum diese Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz Münchner Sicherheitskonferenz heißt. Sie ist nämlich in München zu Hause und fühlt sich hier zu Hause, und das verdanken wir Ihnen. Ich würde aber einen großen Fehler machen, wenn ich diesen Dank nicht auch von vornherein auf diejenigen ausdehnen würde, die nur, nicht nur uns, die hier heute Abend sind, sondern viele andere an diesem langen Wochenende hier in München schützen. Ich meine die vielen Dutzende, die vielen Hunderte Polizeibeamten, nicht nur die Münchner Polizei, sondern die Beamten, die ja auch aus anderen Teilen des Landes zusammengeholt worden sind, Herr Minister Herrmann, ich möchte Ihnen und sozusagen über Sie an diejenigen, die uns hier beschützen, unseren Dank aussprechen. Ich weiß, dass das im kalten Münchner Winter nicht immer ein Zuckerlecken ist.
And I'm now going to switch to English in order to uh, make it easier for our American and other foreign guests. Let me first say that I am extremely grateful to you, Prime Minister Netanyahu, for not only for being here and for speaking to the conference tomorrow, but also for being here tonight and for the, the warm words you had for our honoree, Senator John McCain. You know, every recipient of the Ewald von Kleist Award deserved it. The first one uh, was someone actually born in Bavaria, Dr. Henry Kissinger. And some of you will remember how emotionally touched he was when he received this award here, I think it was nine years ago. So each and every one of the past recipients deserved it, but there is no one, I think, who deserves it more than John McCain, ladies and gentlemen. I am extremely sad that the doctors wouldn't, want, wouldn't let him come here. And I want to thank Mrs. McCain, Cindy McCain, for being here on his behalf. And I know you will tell him how much he is missed here, not only at the conference, but here tonight, where we wanted to honor him in person. Thanks for doing this and for being here. So many international leaders have attended what used to be called Weerkunde, what is now called the Munich Security Conference. Many have given speeches, participated in our debates. John McCain has done all that. His speeches have uh, usually become instant classics. He's been a key participant for several decades now in the transatlantic debate. But John McCain has actually done a lot more than that. He has actually shaped the transatlantic relationship. He has become a symbol of the values the West stands for, ladies and gentlemen. In our anniversary volume, which we published a couple of years ago on the occasion of the 50th anniversary of the Munich Security Conference, he wrote, and I quote, what I came to understand about the Munich Security Conference and Ewald von Kleist's vision in creating it is that at its core, this conference embodies the same idea that animates our broader transatlantic community. It is the idea that Euro-Atlantic democracies, the stewards of freedom, human rights, and the rule of law, should not confront our challenges in isolation. It is the idea that we are stronger, safer, freer together. We broke with history and created our world anew, a community of independent nations with different languages, characteristics, and customs, and occasional disagreements that has the wisdom to recognize an essential common identity as free and just civilizations and the common purpose to remain so." End of quote. In uh, his more recent speeches, Senator McCain has warned of an erosion of the liberal international order which the United States and her allies built after World War II. He called upon all of us not to lose faith in the ideas of the West, not to fall for easy solutions offered by nationalists, xenophobes, or autocrats, not to accept that the international order is crumbling our, un, under our watch. He called on us to accept our responsibility to act 
and to preserve what has been built over the last half century. I know, ladies and gentlemen, that Ewald von Kleist, the founder of this conference, had he lived to be here today, he would have been proud to see this award bestowed upon John McCain. The uh, Munich Security Conference team and I, we are so proud to have Senator McCain as a true and loyal friend and supporter over so many years. And we're so sad he cannot be with us in person today. And he is, by the way, the only person uh, who gets honored by the Munich Security Conference twice. Because about a decade ago, my uh, wonderful predecessor, uh, Horst Telchik, I don't know whether he is somewhere here in the room, Horst Telchik gave uh, the earlier award, uh, which the uh, conference uh, offered at that time, to John McCain. So he's, he's the unique double recipient. It is now my privilege to offer the floor to uh, another great friend of the Munich Security Conference, former Vice President Joe Biden. But before, Mr. Vice President, before you come up here and speak to us, let's just watch a brief video which our team has prepared about the senator. So can we roll the film, please? There is no one on Capitol Hill who has been a more devoted supporter and partner of the Munich Security Conference than Senator John McCain. <laughs> Senator McCain has led for many years the congressional delegation to Munich. That is a very, very unusual opportunity for Europeans and others to interact and to network with senior members of the United States Congress at a moment of serious international crisis. When Ewald von Kleist and their founders of this conference, indeed, it's why they first started coming to Munich, they did not assume that the West would survive because they had seen its near annihilation. They saw the rise of hostile great powers and the failure of deterrence and the wars that followed. From the ashes of the most awful calamity in human history was born what we call the West. What would von Kleist's generation say if they saw our world today? I fear that much about it would be all too familiar for them, and they would be alarmed by it. They would be alarmed by an increasing turn away from universal values and toward old ties of blood and race and sectarianism. But what would alarm them most, I think, is a sense that many of our peoples, including in my own country, are giving up on the West. We should not count each other out. We stand for truth against falsehood, freedom against tyranny, right against injustice, hope against despair, and that even though we will inevitably take losses and suffer setbacks through it all, as long as people of goodwill and courage refuse to lose faith in the West, it will endure. Make no mistake, my friends, these are dangerous times but you should not count America out. So we're extremely grateful to John McCain for his enduring and lasting and continued service to transatlantic relations and uh, for his wonderful friendship and support of the Munich Security Conference.
Mr. Vice President, you have the floor. What a great honor. Your Eminence, State Minister, thank you for your hospitality. Mr. Ambassador and uh, Prime Minister Netanyahu and Sarah, I tell the Prime Minister we've been old friends for a long time. Every time I see Sarah, we Pat Catholics used to believe in a place called purgatory. If you suffered on earth, you got to go straight to heaven. Sarah, no purgatory for you. Straight up. Ladies and gentlemen, um, and Cindy, this is such an honor, a incredible honor to be here tonight to speak briefly about my friend, John McCain. And Cindy, I know how much John wanted to be here in person tonight. Cindy was kind enough to get him on the phone as we were driving over here. He said to give you all his love and wish he were with you tonight. Because uh, he's been coming to the security, the Munich Security Conference for decades. Now, I've been coming a little longer than John with much less consequence. Back when I started, this used to be the Vergunda Conference. And in the United States Senate, it was the territory of the, of the Armed Services Committee. And I remember coming over uh, here the first time with uh, members of the Armed Services Committee, including a Republican named John Tower at the time. And, uh, but one thing has not changed. This was an annual pil pilgrimage for John. And last year, when he, the last year he came to Munich, last year when he came to Munich, he said, quote, that he came to revitalize our common moral purpose, our belief that our values are worth fighting for. I think the emphasis on our moral purpose is needed badly. We all felt and feel his absence today, missing John's signature passion and clarity of purpose in our debates. I love coming to Munich with John because although we'd argue like hell as good friends, this is one of the few places we were almost always in agreement. And I know that uh, receiving this honor from a group of people John knows so well and respects so much means the world to him. As avid as von Kleist, the award uh, is particularly fitting, it seems, to honor my friend tonight because of the stories that they each tell resonate with one another. In this room, von Kleist uh, is remembered as a visionary founder of this conference, a man who saw the need to build channels of cooperation and communications between diplomats and politicians during those difficult Cold War years. Before that, he was a young man asked to shoulder a very, very heavy burden. He was asked to wear a suicide vest in a meeting with Hitler. He was asked to sacrifice his own life for the good of the world. Von Kleist, taking in the gravity of the request, went to his father for advice. And here's what his father said to him. A man who doesn't take such a chance will never be happy again in his life. A man who doesn't take such a chance will never be happy again in his life. So Van Kleist agreed. For his involvement in the ultimately unsuccessful plot to assassinate Hitler, he was imprisoned in Ravenbrook concentration camp. Before being deployed to the German front lines in the final days of the war, and at that time was as good as a death sentence. When I hear that story, I can't help think of the parallels to my friend John McCain, our friend John McCain. 
It was just over 50 years ago that John was shot out of the sky over Vietnam, landed on a lake in Hanoi. The North Vietnamese tossed him into the infamous Hanoi Hilton, where he was systematically beaten and tortured, kept in solitary confinement, facing a suffering that was unimaginable and unendurable for most men and women. Then, after being there eight months, the North Vietnamese suddenly offered him early release. You see, they found out that John's father, an admiral in the United States Navy, had been named Commander-in-Chief of the Pacific Command, placed in charge of all U.S. naval forces in the Vietnam theater. They wanted John to accept preferential treatment and to use it for their own propaganda. Three times they offered John his release. Three times John refused. Knowing what it meant, more torture, more solitary confinement, more suffering, more systematically breaking every bone in his body one at a time. But it was the code. John lived by the military code. First man captured, first man freed. John said he was not the first man captured. Five more years, five more years in virtual hell, because John lived by the code. John knew, like Van Kleist, that a man who doesn't do what is right, no matter what the cost to him personally, will never be happy again in his life. <coughs> and to this day, as all of you know and all of you knew John, John still lives by the code, not just the military code, but the civilian code of honor and dignity. He's been my friend since I was a young senator in the early 70s. He was a young Navy liaison officer who came to the Senate in 1977. We traveled the world together. We grew close. Our families grew close. My two boys, grown men, one gone now, looked up to John, knew John, saw at every opportunity when they'd come to the Senate with me as kids, college students, and grown men to be with John. John, and we were kidding on the way over with Cindy, John and my wife Jill became fast friends. As a matter of fact, I was in a meeting in Greece with Carmen Lise. My wife was with me. John was with me. They didn't feel like going to the meeting in general. And so I went to the meeting with the staff, and John took my wife to a cafe on the waterfront. And the next thing I knew, they were both dancing on a cement table drinking ouzo. <laughs> you think I'm joking, I'm not. <laughs> They're friends. We got to know John's soul. I got to observe him up close, a man who embodies something that my mother used to say, the code. She'd always say, remember, remember, you're defined by your courage, and you're redeemed by your loyalty. That's the definition of John defined by his courage, whatever transgressions would occur, always redeemed by his loyalty. His courage has been on display of late in another battle he's conducted. As our Senate years will attest, John and I disagreed on a number of policy issues, and we'd holler like hell at one another in private and occasionally in public. 
but we were friends first because John and I hope I was always loyal. I would do anything for John, and I know he would do anything for me. That's why, when he was a Navy liaison officer, I encouraged John, knowing he was of the opposite party, to run for the House of Representatives in 1982. I was proud when he joined the Senate where I had been for a while in 1986. In the year 2000, I hoped he would win his party's nomination. I went so far in South Carolina, as Cindy will tell you, to uh, attest to John's character, which was being attacked. I probably hurt him more than I helped him, but. And I couldn't have been more shocked to find myself on the ticket with Barack Obama opposing John in 2008. It was not a comfortable place to be. During that campaign for the presidency, John never abandoned his principles. Even as we began to see the first lapping waves of a rising tide of nationalism, populism, and, and the notion of being more insular that threatens to engulf us today. I never forget, in the midst of that campaign, John was holding a town hall meeting in 2008. And a woman stood to ask a question, and she started by saying, I do not trust Obama. He is an Arab. And John McCain, like few other men or women I've ever served with, fighting like hell, for the presidency, something he may very well have won but for the collapse of Lehman Brothers. Fighting like the devil, interrupted her and said, no, ma'am. He cut her off, but he didn't let it go. He went on to say, referring to Barack, he's a decent family man and citizen that I just happened to disagree, have disagreements with on fundamental issues. How many elected officials in any one of our countries would have done that in the midst of a campaign that was being lost control of having nothing to do with John but the collapse of the economy he had nothing to do with? John always defends what's right. John always stands up for what he believes, regardless. I know John. Lindsey Graham knows John. Our colleagues know John. And we know him to be a man of surpassing intelligence, integrity, and character. And regardless of any political difference we've had, we've always stood shoulder to shoulder as staunch defenders of the enduring bipartisan vision of a vigorous, engaged American leadership, leadership of the liberal international order that was created after World War II. It's a vision that's under attack today, as I tried with less, much less eloquence than John to speak to last night. But frankly, no one put it better than John when I had the honor of presenting to him as chairman of the Constitution Center in Philadelphia the Liberty Medal last year. I want to read a paragraph from what when John said when he accepted the medal. To fear the world we have organized and led for three quarters of a century, to abandon the ideals we, we, we advanced around the globe, to refuse the obligations of international leadership, and our duty to remain the last best hope of Earth for the sake of some half-baked, spurious nationalism cooked up by people who would rather find scapegoats than solve problems is unpatriotic as an attachment to any other tired dogma of the past that Americans have long since consigned to the ash heap of history. John understands better than anyone I've ever known 
America's responsibilities to lead. He's never hesitated or stumbled in his defense of those universal values that have imbued our transatlantic alliance with purpose. Freedom, democracy, human dignity, transparency, openness, collective security. He knows that international problems require international solutions. That's why he was always here in Munich. He knows that to be a good and reliable ally, America's relationships in the world must be built on a foundation of mutual respect and trust. We must be model citizens in the world so that we can lead not only by the example of our power, but as John demonstrated, by the power of our example. John knows the United States does not strengthen itself in the world by walling America off from the world. That's why he so poignantly championed the normalization of American relationship several decades ago with Vietnam. How many world leaders will put aside the understandable resentment and the horrible memories of how he was treated, but for the good of his country, lead, not follow, lead the normalization effort? Throughout his career, John has championed scores of issues critical to our shared future, working to end endemic disease, addressing the crisis of changing climate, defending human rights wherever they were threatened. I can put it no more simply than this. America's leadership in the world is stronger, and Europe is better because of John McCain. John, above all else, was a fighter, the first to jump into the arena. He's never put himself or his party before his country or his duty. And through unwavering service to a mission greater than himself, John has become larger than life. A man who reminds us, even in his absence, of our most sacred values. A man who challenges us to be better leaders, who inspires a new generation of leaders to follow his example. And folks, as we've discussed the last several days, we need it. The future of our democratic values and our liberal international order depends on more leaders being produced like John McCain. Men and women ready to take on those who preach naked nationalism and polarization at home. Men and women who can break through the echo chambers of disinformation and reach across the aisle and the ocean. Men and women who put greater good above their self-interest. They're all, all in too short supply these days in all of our countries, I would argue. And Cindy, if John were here tonight, I know he'd charm us all with his humor while reminding us all that we can do better, that we have to persist in the fight to defend the values and ideas that are paramount to the enduring success of this transatlantic relationship, our liberal world order, our world. That we must seize such chances as are afforded to us and act in the greater good instead of self-interest. So let me end this evening by once more echoing John's eloquence. <clears throat> Last summer, John took the floor of the United States Senate after being released from the hospital with a devastating diagnosis. We all waited for what John was going to say. He walked to the floor and he challenged, a direct challenge to America's leaders with one small modification. I think it's equally applicable message to all of us gathered here tonight. Here's what he said, and I've just changed one word. What greater cause could we hope to serve than helping keep the West a strong, aspiring, 
international beacon of liberty, a defender of the dignity of all human beings and their right to freedom and equal justice. John, believe, as I hope all of you do, that we are the last best hope for humanity, this transatlantic alliance. John has always served that cause serving to help keep us strong, aspiring, defending dignity and freedom. John answered that call. A man who doesn't take such a chance will be never happy again in his life. John has every reason and has been happy in his life. That's why John McCain is the most deserving man I can think of to receive this award. And it's now my great pleasure and privilege to invite his wife, Cindy McCain, another dear friend, up here to accept the honor on John's behalf. Thank you all so much. Um, I am terribly humbled and terribly uh, in awe of this inspiring group that I stand before this evening. Joe, you are such a dear friend to the McCain family. And once again, we rely on you for your strength and your honor and your dignity to help us through a hard time. I can't thank you enough. I can't thank you enough. Um, Joe, as Joe mentioned, John and Joe have been in different parties, and they have each have very strong opinions. I know that surprises you about my husband in particular. But however many differences they've argued over the years, and I'm sure each of them would answer plenty, their friendship endures because some things are just too important for politics. Joe, you have been especially a good friend to my daughter, Megan. Thank you. She is leaning on you in a, in a, in a major way right now, and I, I know this is difficult for all of us. His, his large arms are very encompassing right now to the McCain family. It is so wonderful to be here tonight, and such a relief to be in a place where people debate calmly and courteously most of the time. Unlike the loud argument that has raged in our house, our own house, the McCain house, lately, as John had fought valiantly with his doctors to try to come to Munich. Some have spoken this weekend about the return of great power competition. There's been plenty of competition in my house this week, and I won. I think many of you are familiar with that side of my husband. He's a tough fighter and a strong, valiant leader but he did the right thing this time and not coming. He feels deeply about things, about ideals and values, about what is right and wrong, about his friends and those who would do harm to them. He is passionate. He's not easily deterred. That is why we love him. That is why I love him. Well, most of the time, anyway. <laughs> I can assure you there has been there was nowhere John wanted to be more than right here this weekend. And if, with a little luck, I think he may be watching all this online. We've hooked up a computer at home, so I hope so. 
Um, he loved the, for, he's been coming here for, for over 40 years, as Joe mentioned, debating world events and arguing for the values that he has defended all of his life. In fact, it occurred to me this weekend that Dom has been coming to Munich longer than we've been married. We've been married 37 years. He's been coming over 40 now. Don especially wanted to be here to receive the high honor that you so carefully bestowed on him this evening. He asked me to join you in his place and to read a short statement from him to all of you. To my dear and cherished friends and to my worthy adversaries, it breaks my heart that I cannot be with you tonight. But as Cindy has no doubt told you after many public consultations, and polite disagreements with our doctors, I was strongly advised not to come to Munich. As you all know, I never second guess the experts. I want to thank Joe Biden, Wolfgang Ischlinger, and all of my friends in Munich for honoring me with the award named for a man who was my hero, a visionary, an inspiration to us all, and to the reason we are all here, Yuli von Kleist. Of all my, all my many adventures and remembrances, Munich always stands out. I think about my days as a young Navy captain escorting Senator John Power and his colleagues to this conference and watching as they helped steer the transatlantic alliance through the headiest days of the Cold War. I think about being with Joe Biden and Bill Cohen by the way, Bill Cohen was the best man in our wedding. Bill Cohen and so many others who, as we expanded NATO and took it to war in the Balkans. And I will always remember drinking schnapps with Joe Lieberman and later Sheldon Whitehouse. I offer these reflections not to bask in sentiment, but because it raises a deeper question, why do we come to Munich? Yes, it is for fun and friendships and fond memories, but that is not why Uli von Kleist first brought the Western world together here five decades ago and why we come back year after year. The real reason, reason we come to Munich is because we believe that certain values should order our world, that the peace and prosperity we cherish depend on the survival and success of those values and that they are worth the fighting for. We come to Munich because we want to live in a world where truth transcends falsehood, sovereignty triumphs over subjugation, justice reigns over oppression, freedom overcomes tyranny, where power is transformed into legitimacy and the fate of people and nations is determined by the rule of law and not the whim of rulers. We come to Munich because we know and we can never afford to forget that the alternative to a world ordered by these values is a dark and cruel place where laws and rules and rights count for nothing and selfish brute force trumps all. But put simply, we come to Munich because sustaining our vision of world, of world order, though it requires wealth and power and realism, is not merely a material struggle. It's a moral struggle. It's about the values that, we, that will govern our world. That is why we are allies. That is why we have stood by each other and sacrificed for each other and invested, our common, invested in our common defense and why we must continue to do so. My friends, if there is a benefit that comes from advanced age, it is the sense of perspective it affords. I have been blessed with an extraordinary life. I have experienced my share of hardship and suffering and conflict. But there is no question that the world I have had the good fortune to live in is more peaceful, more prosperous, and more filled with love and happiness and beauty and the values we all cherish than the world my father and grandfather knew. 
My youngest children have only read about the Berlin Wall. Their world was never divided by it. Their lives weren't affected by its shadow. But for those of us born before the Cold War or during the Cold War, that blessing was the achievement of a, quote, long and twilight struggle. I remember the enormous sacrifice it entailed, the many brave souls, some of whom were my friends, that gave their lives to secure it. I remember a span of more than half a century when for all our differences, Americans maintained a bipartisan commitment to the freedom and security of our allies. All together with our allies, we kept faith with those on the other side of those walls that divided the oppressed from the free. From the free. We were confident they wanted the same things we did, freedom equal justice, the rule of law, a fair chance to prosper by their own industry and talents. We kept the faith and we prevailed. This is our greatest inheritance and it did not happen by accident. It was born of imagination and resolve and good service, much of it rendered every year, every year here in Munich. I have endeavored to do my small part to defend the values we hold dear. And I can assure you that the rewards I have derived from this service are far greater than the contribution I have made. I find myself more and more returning to the words of Marilyn Robinson. It has seemed to me sometimes as though the Lord breathes on the poor gray ember of creation and it turns to radiance for a moment, a year, or a span of life. Whatever your turn, whatever your turn, your eyes and the world can shine. It shines for trans transfiguration. You don't have to bring a thing to, to it except a little willingness to see. That is, to acknowledge that there is more beauty than our eyes can bear. That precious things have been put into our hands. And to do nothing more than to honor them would do great harm. I am counting on, on all of you as my friends to honor the precious, beautiful things that are still entrusted in our care. I am counting on you to be brave. I am counting on you to be useful. I am counting on you to keep your faith and never give up, though the true radiance of our world may at times seem obscured. Though we will never suffer adversity and setbacks and mis misfortune, never, never ever stop fighting for all that is good and just and decent, our world and each other. Thank you. <laughs>